Today's webinar is about the 15th Amendment. Um, we've called this in extending the right to vote, the 15th Amendment and its enduring impact on voting rights. Today's speaker, Dr. Terry Ann Scott, is an award-winning historian, author, and a very influential speaker. This series about the Constitution has now been going on for almost a year, and we decided that it was important that we look at each amendment, the context in which it was passed, and what has been going on since then. Uh, the 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870 as the last of the what are called the Reconstruction Amendments. The 15th Amendment prohibits the denial of a citizen's right to vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Despite its ratification, state laws, literary tests, literacy tests, poll taxes, the grandfather clause, and voter intimidation continued to prevent African Americans from exercising their full voting rights. Dr. Scott will explain why this amendment was crucial in the fight for equality, how it addressed but did not fully resolve the barriers <clears throat> to voting in the aftermath of the Civil War, and how this amendment continues to protect voting rights today. Our, our featured guest is now the director of the Institute of Power, which she will clearly tell us about. Um, she previously held an associate professor of American history, chair of the Department of History at Hood College in Maryland. And during her tenure at Hood, uh, Dr. Scott received numerous awards, including the college's highest commendation for professors, the Excellence in Teaching Award. Dr. Scott earned her doctorate from the University of Chicago, where she was awarded a fellowship from the university's board of trustees. She received her master's degree with distinction from Southern Methodist University. She regularly lectures about race, sports, social movements, and voting rights across the country. She is a frequently uh, asked for guest on regional and national media programs, including NPR. She has been a featured historian in the History Channel's uh, several episodes of I Was There and is the also critically acclaimed documentary, Lynching Postcards, Token of a Great Day, which received a 2022 NAACP Image Award, a 2022 Peabody nomination, and was actually shortlisted listed for an Academy Award. She is slated to be in several other documentaries. And so we are so grateful that she has made herself available to us today and to our listeners. Uh, we invite you now, Dr. Scott, to take the mic and tell us about the 15th Amendment. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, I should explain my lighting is not what I would typically prefer. And the reason for that is I'm not at my home in Maryland. I'm actually in Seattle, Washington in a hotel room currently. And I'm in that hotel room because uh, we were honored with the Institute for Common Power, the organization I work for, and Common Power, our parent organization, to have been honored last night during Monday night football for the Seattle Seahawks. We've done extensive work with them on voter engagement and education. We took them on a learning tour recently and they wanted to, to honor us during their Inspire Change game. And so I'm here in Seattle after this lecture, I'll head to the airport, but I am so happy to be able to join you. So good morning to those of you with me on the West Coast and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Thank you for the beautiful introduction. We will be together today for about an hour and this will be mildly interactive. Of course, please ask questions. I saw in the question and answer that the chat is disabled. So I don't know if we wanna disable that for questions, but drop questions either in the chat or question and answer, and I will answer them at the end. I'm also gonna ask you to have something to write with because we will be doing a very short quiz at one point in this conversation. As noted, I am the director of the Institute for Common Power. We are the educational branch of a voter engagement and voter mobilization organization called Common Power that is based in Seattle. Um, we do work that helps pull back the curtain of history to demonstrate why it is so important 
for people to vote. So I encourage you to look at the work that we do, and I'll have a website at the end that you can go to. As noted, I'm also a former professor of African American history at Hood College. I will actually be teaching part-time at the University of Maryland next semester as I continue my work full-time for the Institute for Common Power. So we're going to talk about the 15th Amendment today. I thought it appropriate then to begin with the language from the 15th Amendment, because the 15th Amendment is about something that I have particular expertise in, and that's the history of African Americans in this country, which is really broadly the history of all of us in this country. And it reads as follows in section one, the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And so what are the central questions that we're going to look at today? Well, they include the following. Why was it necessary? How was the 15th Amendment achieved? What change did it create? And very specifically, what was the backlash to that change? In some ways, we are continuing to exist in a moment where there is backlash to the change. And so I will bring us to the modern era and demonstrate how the 15th Amendment is being used today and how the 15th Amendment is being avoided today to advance a particular notion of who should and should not be able to vote. As Ms. Campbell noted, there were three Reconstruction Amendments. And so we begin then with the end of the Civil War, because as you see following the war, there were about 4 million African Americans who were free, formerly in enslaved, building life in the South, the vast majority of whom lived in the South. And then we engage in a period of what is called Reconstruction in this country, which lasts from about 1865 until 1877 and closes slightly earlier in some states. But that is the official end of 1877 and the official beginning of a backlash to the implementation of the 15th Amendment. But in the process, African Americans immediately following enslavement were beginning to build their lives in freedom finding family members as they could, establishing schools as they were excluded from schools for white students. And those Reconstruction Amendments that were passed during that period include the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment. And so to place the 15th Amendment in historical context, I'll spend about two minutes talking about both the 13th and the 14th Amendment. And what's important to remember, specifically as we move into these amendments, and the 13th Amendment, which officially abolishes slavery, is that freedom didn't come in a singular moment. But that freedom for the 4 million enslaved African Americans was, in fact, a process. And that process began with self-emancipation before the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865. What do I mean by self-emancipation? People who were enslaved on plantations and in smaller homes across the South and in certain portions of the Upper South, they ran away. They freed themselves. They engaged in what was very much a courageous endeavor to take freedom on the eve of the Civil War and throughout the Civil War. And if you assume that the Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery, you assume that in many ways because that's what we are taught. When we talk about Juneteenth every year, which is the holiday that commemorates African Americans, about 250,000 of them in the state of Texas, finding out that slavery had ended, people begin by saying the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves. It did not. The Emancipation Proclamation very specifically stated that by January 1st, 1863, those individuals who were enslaved in rebelling states, places that were rebelling against the Union, were free. So if you are a slave in Mississippi, what does that mean? Theoretically, you're, you're free. But do you go to the, your enslaver and say, well, I'm free. You have to let me go. And they say, no problem. No, that is not how it played out. And so many times people took to the road and escaped. In states like where I live in Maryland, it was, excuse me, a union state that still had slavery. And they did not abolish slavery until November of 1864. What the Emancipation Proclamation did do successfully was allow for Black men to join the war effort and be in the armed forces. And so following this 13th Amendment, then we have the beginning of what was called presidential reconstruction. Presidential reconstruction would be seen over by Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson makes the friends, including myself, of one of the worst presidents in American history. He was, in fact, an enslaver who was from Tennessee, who believed in the institution of slavery, but did not believe that the South should remove itself from the Union. And so that created quite this kind of disparity among those in the North who wanted things to go a particular 
particular way, and Andrew Johnson. He wanted to have wholesale understanding and, and reconciliation to those who had rebelled against the union and say, you can come back into the union, no problem, except for those who had a holding of $20,000 or more because he had a bit of a resentment against upper class individuals. He vetoed the Freedom, Freedmen's Bureau, which was an organization that was designed by Congress to help transition recently enslaved people into freedom by finding them jobs and work, by creating schools for them. And he was vehemently opposed to African-American suffrage. So much so that Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist from Maryland, went to see him at the White House, and they talked about black suffrage. And Johnson said, there's no way I will allow African-Americans to vote. And then he had this almost feeling of being insulted by Douglas even asking, because he said to him, I may own slaves, but I've never sold any, which is fascinating to me. He wanted some kind of recommend, some, some commendation for that. Johnson goes on something, a swing around the world tour where he goes to different states and tries to drum up support for his candidacy, for his um, administration. He casts himself as Jesus and says, I am being persecuted by Congress like Jesus because Jesus is, or Congress is in opposition to the work that I'm doing. I can tell you that it never works out well when somebody compares themselves to Jesus and say, I'm being per persecuted in the same way that he is. During that election, Congress becomes a majority Republican. Now, I put an asterisk there because we never want to assume that Republicans and Democrats of the past are the same as Republicans in the current era. Political platforms are not static. They change and shift over time. So at this particular time, Republicans, and particularly radical Republicans, the more quote-unquote militant branch of the Republican Party, took control of Congress. And they engage in something called radical or congressional reconstruction. And the first way to make sure that the things that they implement went through was an actual military occupation of the South. These are Union soldiers entering the South to set up posts. And one of the things that they were able to pass under military or uh, congressional reconstruction was our third am or second amendment of the three reconstruction amendments the 14th Amendment, 1868, and it dictates what we know today, citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the United States. It reversed the Dred Scott decision, the Dred Scott this horrific Supreme Court decision from 1950s that dictated that any Black person, whether free or enslaved, did not have a right to citizenship. And so the, the 14th Amendment would say that states could not deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person equal protection of those laws. And it gave citizenship to all of the African Americans who had been denied citizenship under the Dred Scott decision. And here is a very, very short list of cases that have been able to, over the years, use the 14th Amendment to pass. Loving versus Virginia. Virginia, for instance, that says you cannot have anti-miscegenation laws that say people from different races can't marry. It has been used to push for marriage equality. It was used in Brown versus Board of Education, the very famous case that allowed for desegregation of public uh, education. And also under radical reconstruction, with that military occupation of the South, the South is divided into five military districts. And you see them. And so Texas and Louisiana account for one. You see Virginia, North Carolina, you can see that on the map. And under the terms of this radical reconstruction, where Republicans had a secure majority in Congress, a veto, uh, um, uh, where they could veto, or I'm sorry, they could override any vetoes by Johnson, they required, with this new reconstruction, for states to do the following. They had to ratify the 14th Amendment. They had to write new state constitutions because the state constitutions that were written under presidential reconstruction included black codes that looked a lot like slave codes that dictated that black people could not vote, that they could not bear arms, that in some places they couldn't address or they couldn't dress above their quote unquote status. It was about keeping them in their place and returning them to a state that very clearly mimicked enslavement. They also, under Radical Reconstruction, renewed the Freedmen's Bureau. All of these things Johnson vetoed. And because they had such a strong majority in Congress, they were able to, able to override each of his vetoes. And they were able to pass something that serves as a precursor to the 15th Amendment. Oftentimes, what we assume, just like when we assume that the Emancipation Proclamation 
freed all enslaved people. We assume that the first time black people, black men particularly, because women still did not have the right to vote, black men could vote in this country was with the 15th amendment. That's not true. There's a different narrative, a different truth that's associated with that 15th amendment. Black men had the right to vote with the first Reconstruction Act, three years before the 15th Amendment was passed. That is so instrumental to the passing of the 15th Amendment that I can very factually say we wouldn't have the 15th Amendment at that time unless Black men had the right to vote. And I will expand on that in just a moment. And so Congress passes the first Reconstruction Act. That act stated that states must allow Black male suffrage and works as this precursor to the 15th Amendment. What happens? Black men vote in mass. In places like Mississippi, the number of registered African-American men to vote exceeded 96%. 96% of Black men registered to vote in the state of Mississippi. That 96% by 1964 would drop to 5.7%. How do we go from 96% to 5.7% in Mississippi? How do we go from similar percentages in other Southern states at high percentage of black registered voters to similarly low percentages of black registered voters during reconstruction versus the 1960s? That's part of the path that we'll take today. But after the passage of the first Reconstruction Act in 1867, look what happens in states after state. South Carolina has a higher majority because they had a larger black population. But by the South Carolina convention in 1868, 76 of the black elected delegates or 76 of the delegates were black. Two thirds of them were formerly enslaved. They outnumbered the number of white elected delegates. There were only 48. You see this in state after state after state. Places like the state of Alabama, a place that I visit very frequently with the Institute for Common Power, elected a man named Representative named James T. Rapier. He lived in Montgomery. He was instrumental in passing at the time along with other Black legislators, the 1875 Civil Rights Act. The 1875 Civil Rights Act looked a lot like the 1964 Civil Rights Act. He said, when he helped pass this act, I can't even go from my home in Montgomery to Washington, D.C. to do the duties that I have been charged to do because I can't find a restaurant to serve me. I can't find a hotel to sleep in. And so the 1875 Civil Rights Act said that you cannot discriminate in places of public accommodation. In 1883, the Supreme Court overturned it. That's why it matters who sits on the Supreme Court. They said it was unconstitutional and a reach of states' rights. And so it was not passed again until it was passed in the form of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And so you had a large number of Black politicians, Black elected officials, because of the 1867 First Reconstruction Act passed during Congressional Reconstruction. Black people would heavily represent those who would secure new laws and amendments that establish new freedoms. We often don't think about how instrumental African-Americans were to the establishment of these amendments, particularly the 15th Amendment. In state after state in the North, sometimes we like to fancy the South to be something that is wholly different from the North, that they were opposed to Black advancement and Black suffrage, and the North was in sync with it. It's not true. In state after state, Northern voters rejected a bill for Black suffrage before the 15th Amendment. In Michigan, in Ohio, in Kansas, in Missouri, in New York, by vast majorities, they said, we don't want Black suffrage. Places like Minnesota and Iowa actually voted for it. But it is that rejection of the ability for Black people to vote, of the desire among voters in the North and in the South at the time, because this is before the first Reconstruction Act, it is that objection to Black suffrage that pushed Congress to pass that first Reconstruction Act to allow for Black suffrage. Representative Thaddeus Stevens from Pennsylvania said this about Black suffrage in the South. If it be just, it should not be denied. If it be necessary, it should be adopted. And if it be punishment to traitors, they deserve it. So where does that take us? Amendments proposed by Congress or convention become valid and this stands today, only when ratified by the legislators or conventions in three-fourths of the states. So what does that mean? By this time then, by the time the 15th Amendment is pushed for ratification, by the time it is ratified in 1870, it was Black men and their high number of registra registration that became instrumental to the passage and the securing of the 15th Amendment. It is important to remember 
and I'm going to read this because of that importance and because this is probably very new to most of you. It is important to remember that the large number of Black elected officials and Black voters in state offices means that Black men were instrumental in securing the 15th Amendment. We didn't give the 15th Amendment to Black men. Black men gave the 15th Amendment to us. And so what did that 15th Amendment read? The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It's ratified in 1870, and that, together with the 1867 First Reconstruction Act, ensured that Reconstruction in America became a period of high success among Blacks for political power. Black people held public office during Reconstruction at approximately a number of 2,000, an unprecedented number and percentage of Black elected officials. They were justices of the peace. They were congressmen, sheriffs. In the early scholarship on Reconstruction, historians often characterize Reconstruction as a failure. But Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, in his famous work, Black Reconstruction, which was published, I believe, in 1935, said Black Reconstruction in the South was not a failure, it was a success. It was a success because Black men could vote and they voted in mass. It was a success because of the first Reconstruction Act and the 15th Amendment, and they had over 2,000 elected Black officials. Now, for a minute, think about then how white former enslavers and others who benefited from the system of slavery who were not Black felt about this high level of Black political power. You see a phrase there that reads Negro domination. That's not my phrase. That is a phrase that you would hear regularly during the Reconstruction period from white Southerners who said, we are now facing Negro domination or Negro rule. The idea of a high level of Black political power grated on the nerves of these individuals. And the idea then was, how do we prevent this from happening? How do we undermine the 15th Amendment to make sure that we don't have such a high level of Black political power? The phrase Negro domination and Negro rule is something that we will continue to hear well into the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. We don't want Negro domination. You see it in newspapers and in interviews and speeches. Black freedom expressions, community building, and voting were hallmarks of Reconstruction. But there was another hallmark of Reconstruction, and that was the reestablishment of white supremacy and political and social control. No more Negro rule. No more Negro domination. This was an article that was posted in papers across North Carolina that was part of a white supremacy campaign to push all black politicians out of office. It was one that sought to demonize African-American men to show them, and you see on this left side of your screen, grabbing white women, there were articles that accompanied this that characterized black pol political leaders as rapists, as brutes. They wanted to undermine black political power as much as possible. And this was handed to Southerners with the election of 1876. The election of 1876 is what officially ends Reconstruction and allows for a space to where the 15th Amendment could be undermined, could be skirted. There were two candidates, Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden. Neither had the requisite 185 electoral college votes needed to win. There were 20 disputed votes because of voter fraud of primarily in places like Florida, um, white voters stuffing ballots, trying to intimidate black voters from being able to vote. President Ulysses S. Grant actually at the time said that he lost a couple of states because of white um, voter intimidation of black voters. And so a compromise ensues because of this. The South says you can have things happening with my uh, one second. OK, I can go to the next slide now. You can have your candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes. But if we allow him to be the one who goes into office, we're going to need four things. And the South says this. These are the terms of the end of Reconstruction or what are called what is called the Compromise of 1877. We want the appointment of at least one Southerner to Hayes's cabinet. We want federal aid for railroads in the South, because if you have money for railroads and the expansion of railroads, you can connect regional economies. You can make sure that the economy of a particular region flourishes. We want the removal, those, those Union troops who were there establishing order to reconstruction. The South said, we want them gone. We want the removal of troops from the South, and we want you to leave race relations to us. No more Negro rule, no more Negro domination. This is a sign in Florida of a Black person being lynched and, and hanged in effigy. 
and says this n-word voted. And this is a scene on a bridge that will take us in just a bit to closer to the end of our lecture in Selma, Alabama, when black people were marching to secure the right to vote and were beaten by police officers and local militia. Time to take that quiz I mentioned to you. Here's what I'd like you to do. Take out a piece of paper, or you can take your phone and put notes. You're going to answer a number of questions and I'm gonna open up a timer on my phone. You only have 44 seconds to do that. So I'm gonna give you just a couple of minutes to do this. Okay, are you ready? 44 seconds to answer all of the questions. And if you get any of them wrong, you fail. Your time begins now. Twenty four seconds. Ten seconds. Pens down, phones closed, time's up. First question I'd like you to drop in the chat and answer to this. Did anyone finish answering all those questions in that 44 seconds? And I'm gonna open the chat so I can see your answers. No, nope, not even close. Thank you for your honesty. I have three more questions for you. Were you afraid for your life while you were taking this test? Okay, a few of you finished and I'll show you the answers to see if you get them. Were you afraid for, with, for your life when taking this test? Probably not. Did you worry you might be imprisoned or shot? I think I can assuredly say no, you didn't. Were you concerned that you would be fired from your job for taking this test? No, none of you can answer yes to any of those questions. The test that you just took was a literacy test. The literacy test you took was from 1965. Didn't even start basically, exactly. Thank you for your honesty to everybody on there. You took it from 1965. Now, if you had taken this literacy test and to vote, this was a test you would have needed to vote, uh, you would have had 68 questions and about 10 minutes to complete it, which is why I gave you that same number of 44 seconds for the number of questions that you had. This looked very similar to a test you would have taken in the late 1800s. The tests emerged following the close of Reconstruction, and they existed in states across the South. One of the only Southern states actually that didn't have literacy tests was the state of Texas because they used other disenfranchising measures. Here are the answers to the questions, by the way, in case you were curious. The last one, the first four were from Alabama. The last one is actually from a Louisiana literacy test that reads much like an IQ test, and it was intentionally ambiguous to throw people off. Here's another one from Mississippi. So this would have been what you take, what you have right before you uh, interpret portions of the Constitution. Look at some of the questions. What is your occupation? Where is your business carried on? By whom are you employed? Why might somebody ask some of those questions to an individual registering to vote in the state of Mississippi? It's a form of intimidation. Somebody use that word in the chat. Because if you are African-American and they're asking you, what is your occupation and where do you work? then they can go and tell your employer that you attempted to register to vote. And that's exactly what happened. A famous woman named, named Fannie Lou Hamer attempted to register to vote, a black sharecropper in the state of Mississippi, in Ruralville, Mississippi. She was beaten and kicked off of her land as a sharecropper simply for attempting to register to vote. No more Negro domination. If you had walked into a registrar's office in the state of Mississippi, you would have seen this sign on the wall. After 10 days, applicants' names and addresses are published for two consecutive weeks in the newspaper. Therefore, everybody will know that you attempted to vote. These are facially neutral laws. The fact that, and I will show you how the Supreme Court had a hand in this, the fact that literacy tests were a legal thing to give to people were facially neutral. What does that mean? Facially neutral laws, and some of you may be attorneys out there, were laws that in the language of the law, it's non-discriminatory, but in the application and the outcome of the law, it's discriminatory. 
And so in the language of the law, everybody has to take a literacy test is not discriminatory. But in the outcome and the application of taking a literacy test, that's discriminatory. And these facially neutral laws exist in many states across the country today, which is where we'll end the, our presentation. Not quite yet. I'm going to go for probably about another 15 minutes before we get to the end of that. It was at the registrar's discretion. And so if you're a white applicant, the registrar, who was a white male in southern states, would often give assistance to, Af to white folks. To black folks, they would not. And they may ask additional questions. I'm going to play a clip from a movie named Selma. It's one minute in length. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it. She represents a real person from Selma, Alabama in 1965 who is attempting to register to vote. And she just took the literacy test that you took. You work with Mr. Dunn down at the rest home, ain't that right? Yes. I wonder what old Dunn will say when I tell him one of his gals down here stirring a fuss. I ain't stirring no fuss. I'm just here trying to register to vote. Recite the Constitution's preamble. You know what a preamble is? We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. How many county judges in Alabama? 67. at the registrar's discretion. And so you see, she she was able to say how many judges were in Alabama. She could not name them. That was not part of the requirement. Facially neutral, non-discriminatory in the language of the law, discriminatory in the application. A voting report that came out by the United States Commission on Civil Rights in 1965, just before the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed, noted this, that in places like Mississippi, counties are giving quote unquote Negroes more difficult constitutional sections to interpret than whites. And they're affording assistance, excuse me, to white applicants, but not to the Negroes. So what did it look like? For example, a white applicant, and this comes directly out of the government report, a white applicant might be asked to copy out and interpret the following. Article 12, section 240 of the constitution. All elections are by the people, shall be by ballot. All elections by the people shall be by ballots. Very easy to write out and interpret. A black applicant might be asked to copy and interpret that. That's a facially neutral law. Everybody has to copy out and write something, but black people are asked to write something different to stop any form of black political power and black people being able to register to vote. They're facially neutral. Or, and this next part seems as though I am making it up because it is so asinine and yet a part of our history. And this is why I always tell my students, this is what people have gone through for us to have the right to vote. We must vote in every election. The registrar might ask a black person to guess how many jelly bar beans are in a jar of jelly or how many jelly beans are in a jar, how many windows are on the White House or how many bubbles are on a bar of soap. There was no intention to allow black people to vote after reconstruction in the South. What were additional obstacles to voting? This is an actual card that was left by the Ku Klux Klan, given to a family after they tried to take the literacy test in Jefferson County, Mississippi in 1963. And so this was not just the Klan who was a part of this. Sometimes it's easy to say, oh, this was just the Klan who was doing this. It was police who were stopping people from registering to vote. It was general citizens who were beating people and intimidating people. It was local government who served as the registrars and hired the registrars to stop people from registering to vote. This was coming from every aspect of society. What you see here on the left is Reverend C.T. Vivian. What you don't see in that picture is he has about 100 teachers from Selma, Alabama, who are attempting to register to vote at the Dallas County Courthouse there in Selma. And that is a sheriff, Sheriff Jim Clark, who is standing there, not allowing teachers to register to vote. After this picture was taken, Sheriff Jim Clark punched Reverend C.T. Vivian in the face, knocked him to the ground, and pushed all of the teachers away and arrested many of them to stop them from registering to vote. This is a very short view of people who have died or who were beaten 
or put in prison for attempting to register people to vote. What you see on this image is that not everybody is black because once people engaged in the work of trying to secure civil rights, human rights for black people in the South, it didn't matter what color you were, you were subject to being killed. Lamar Smith, a black voting advocate was murdered on August 13th in 1955 on the courthouse lawn one day in Mississippi. The sheriff witnessed it, witnessed him being murdered and there were no indictments. Jack Turner was lynched in Butler, Alabama in 1882 for organizing black voters in Choctaw County. And we have to understand that there is no Southern exceptionalism to this. Voting restrictions required the sanctioning of the federal government to continue. What do I mean by that? In a case called Williams versus Mississippi, there was a case that challenged the 1890 New Mississippi Constitution. So the New Mississippi Constitution, trying to circumvent the 15th Amendment, said you need to do the following things to be able to vote. You need to live in the state for six years, pay a $2 poll tax, and take a literacy test. Okay. Everybody has to do this, facially neutral. Henry Williams was a black man who was convicted of murder by an all-white jury. And he said, the fact that my jury was all white made it not made it discriminatory and pushed against my 14th Amendment rights. Well, what does voting have to do with his jury being all white? If you know, put that in the chat. What does voting have to do with his jury being all white? I'm looking at the chat right now and I just noticed that uh, Malcolm, thank you for sharing that. That's incredible that Fannie Lou Famer was a friend of yours. She is truly an American hero. And thank you for the work that you did in Mississippi. What does Henry Williams' jury have to do with being white? If you are saying that it is because the jury rolls, that's right. All right, Penelope and Eve Aaron. The juries are picked from the voting rolls. If you can't register to vote, and if the voting rolls are all white, then the jury's going to be all white. That's right. Do you know what the Supreme Court said? No, we don't buy that. In Williams versus Mississippi in 1898, they said the operation of the constitution and laws is not limited by their language or effects to one race. That gave sanction to all Southern states to implement voter restrictions to stop black people from being able to vote. And yet the governor of Mississippi at the time, who eventually became a Senator, James Kimball Vardaman with his cape, in this picture, said there is no use to equivocate or lie about the matter. Mississippi's Constitutional Convention was held for no other purpose than to eliminate the N-word from politics. Not the ignorant, but the N-word. They didn't equivocate about it. They didn't lie about it. And the Supreme Court still sanctioned the ability of states to use those measures to stop people from voting. 1868, Black folks in Mississippi, men registered at 96%, white men at 55%. It drops down to 5.7% by 1892 and 6.7% by 1964. You have similar numbers across the South. This is just Louisiana and Alabama. By 1965 in Alabama, there were several counties that didn't have a single Black person registered to vote, including Lowndes County, which was 80% Black, and not one Black person was registered to vote. Voter registrations were part of something called a Jim Crow regime. Jim Crow, we see the whites only, colored only signs in bathrooms and water fountains, but Jim Crow included all aspects of private and public life. It was a way to codify white supremacy. And one of the things that was at the core of it was stymieing any kind of black political expression and power. And so just as this was a part of a Jim Crow regime, dismantling these kinds of voter restrictions required the persistence of a civil rights movement. People who had worked from the very beginning across racial boundaries to dismantle these restrictions. And that would come to head ahead in Selma, Alabama. We're gonna go for about five more minutes and then we'll start with um, questions and answers. On Bloody Sunday, March 7th. Now, I don't want you to assume that this was the first moment that black people pushed against the boundaries of voter restrictions. This was a culmination. What happened on March 7th, 1965 on that bridge and what it led to, that is something that people had organized for, for decades. There were so many lawsuits that preceded this, so many protests in the years previous to this, but this was the pivotal moment. Selma was the moment, the watershed moment, when we were able to secure the 1965 Voting Rights Act and create change so that what was supposed to exist in the 15th Amendment was theoretically enforced. The original idea was by James Bevel, a civil rights activist, who said after a man, a 26-year-old man named Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed by police 
in uh, he was shot by police in Marion, Alabama, and died about nine days later in uh, Selma, Alabama, at a hospital because he was engaging in a civil rights protest protecting his mother and his grandfather from being beaten by a police officer, stepped in front of his mother and the police officer shot him in his stomach. And civil rights activists were so enraged by this that they said, we should deliver his body to the state capitol in Montgomery, 54 miles away from Selma, and walk it there and give it to George Wallace, the governor on the steps and say, this has been the cost of us pushing for freedoms. Cooler heads prevailed and they said, we will do a march that does not take Jimmy Lee Jackson with, with us, but it commemorates, it honors, it examines, it allows people to see bare the cost of this work. And so led by John Lewis and Hosea Williams and so many other, one, Mr. Charles Molden, who I have the honor of traveling with regularly to teach people about this history. He was sixth in line and only 17 years old. Ms. Joanne Bland, I have the honor to work with her, who lives in Selma and was 11 years old when she was on that bridge and had already been arrested 13 times by the time she was 11 for engaging in civil rights activity. 600 people, including Mr. Charles Molden and John Lewis and Hosea Williams and Joanne Bland, put their foot to pavement and attempted to walk from Selma to Montgomery. They didn't get much more than a mile before police officers told these peaceful protesters to turn around and go back to their church or their homes. And before they could make a move, they were beaten by police officers and by citizens on horses and they were gassed. But this happened right in front of television cameras. Civil rights activity made the news at this point in the civil rights movement and it was blast all over newspapers from across the country. And so it took in total three attempts to be able to do this march. And finally, they had President Johnson who got involved and got on the television March 11th and said, it ought to be possible for black people to vote. And he invoked the words of the march of the uh, civil rights movement at the end of his speech. And he said, we shall overcome. And he said, I'm going to support a voting rights act to ensure that all citizens have the right to vote. And so finally, a third attempt, a march from Selma to Montgomery that started with 600 people, ended with 25,000 people on March 25th, right in front of that state capitol where George Wallace stayed inside and did not come outside to talk to people, and Dr. King delivering a speech about the work that they were doing. And it led then, August 6, 1965, to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act outlawed, out, outlawed those literacy tests. It allowed federal examiners to oversee elections. And by the end of the year, there were 250,000 new black voters. In the state of Mississippi, for instance, remember 6.7% just a few years before, by 1965, it was 66.5% of black people registered to vote in the state of Mississippi. Now in the last few minutes, before we open it up for questions, I wanna to point to this. And remember this section, section five of the 19th voting rights, 1965 Voting Rights Act, which has since been gutted, requires the Department of Justice to provide pre-clearance for changes to voting processes to avoid discrimination. So if you are a place in the country, not just Southern states, this applies to actually some places, and you see this on my notes, on my slides in New York and California, and you have a history of voter discrimination, before you make any changes, before you say, I want a voter ID law, I want to cut early voting, I want to change our ballot, you had to get approval from the Department of Justice to make sure that it doesn't discriminate against people like you had done in this particular area in the past. But a 2013 Supreme Court ruling said that you don't need to do so. And it's making voter suppression today in our modern day, December 19th, 2023, possible. It was a case that came out of Shelby County, Alabama in 2013. And with a split Supreme Court decision, five to four, those five justices said, you don't need to, uh, to do this anymore. You don't, you don't need to get pre-clearance. States can now make changes to voting requirements without pre-clearance. And there's an incredible dissent by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where she equates this to throwing an umbrella away in the middle of a storm. And she was incensed by this ruling. What happened? Within 24 hours of the ruling, the state of Texas implemented a voter ID law that disproportionately impacts Latinx, Black, and poor people. The state of Texas, since, has one drop box per county. That includes Harris County a highly minority county that is the biggest county in the state. It is a county that is bigger than some states in this country. One drop box. That means people have to drive through Houston traffic 
sometimes 50 something miles to drop off a ballot. That's it. In 2014, the state of Alabama enacted a voter ID law. That's fine. That's facially neutral, right? There's no discrimination in that. Following year, Alabama Governor Robert Bentley closed 31 motor vehicle locations because he said there were budgetary issues. Well, a study demonstrated that the majority of those locations were in counties with black majorities. Facially neutral laws. I'm going to leave you with this slide. I'm not leaving. We'll have some time for question and answers. Following the 2020 elections, the 2013 Supreme Court ruling has made this possible. 33 states have enacted laws that restrict access to voting. They restrict voting by mail. They impose restrictive voter ID laws. And the laws disproportionately, highly disproportionately impact poor people, elderly people, largely African-Americans, Latinx and LGBTQ plus individuals. In Montana, and this is just a sampling, the law ends same day registration. Those who voted primarily for registration were Native Americans. They were the ones who used same-day registration. In Florida, there were restrictions on mail-in ballots. Black people vote disproportionately higher by mail. Texas, the one drop box. In Georgia, there is a new law that criminalizes the distribution of food and water to people waiting in line to vote. Areas with higher Black populations statistically had much longer waits, 6 to 13 hours. This came after Georgia attempted to stop early voting on Sunday. It was disproportionately Black people who were engaging in souls to the polls. Now, I will say this. I am the director of the Institute for Common Power. We are a nonpartisan 501c3 nonprofit organization. But what I am saying is not partisan. It is factual. There is one political party that, inst that institutes these voting restrictive measures, and there is one political party who is working to make sure everybody can vote. That is not partisan. That is a fact. I would love for you to join our newsletter so that you can learn more about the work we're doing. We have a lot of free lectures. We have Dr. Eric Foner, the master of reconstruction, who is coming to, to the uh, seminal reconstruction historian, I should say, was coming to speak with us on January 10th. If you sign up for our newsletter, you can learn about the work we do there and the voter registration members, measures that we have here. That's why I'm in a hotel room. Like I said, I know some of you joined late. I'm in a hotel room in Seattle, Washington, because the Seattle Seahawks last night on Monday Night Football honored us for the work that we do with them for voter engagement and education. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I am happy to take some questions in our last 10 minutes. Dr. Scott, what a fabulous presentation. Um, I want you to know that as you were doing it, people were writing in saying, please tell me this is recorded. Um, and I want to assure everyone it is recorded. It thank will you. be on our website. It will be on our YouTube. Um, and everyone who is on this call will get uh, notice as soon as it's up, which we usually Wonderful. get it up within a couple of days. Um, and so we <laughs> invite you to share it widely. We do this because we believe that this history needs to be shared widely. Um, two quick questions that came in from the audience, and I invite you to continue to put them in the Q&A. Uh, what percentage of Black people are now registered in Alabama and Mississippi? You know, I, I saw that question. I don't know the exact percentage, but I do know this, that there was a recent Supreme Court ruling that actually was in the favor of making sure that all people had the right to vote in Alabama that went against gerrymandering. And so there were gerrymandered districts in the state of Alabama. This was just a couple of months ago. Gerrymandered districts in the state of Alabama that um, were diluting Black political power. And the Supreme Court said, you need to redraw those districts so that Black people have political power in those particular districts. The state of Alabama rejected that. They went back to the Supreme Court about a month ago with poorly drawn districts. The re Supreme Court rejected it again. And so I think what will happen in the next election, this is a big win for Alabama and for the ability for people to vote, is that those districts will um, allow for more political representation of African-Americans in the state. The state of Alabama still has one of the most restrictive uh, voting laws in the country. There's no early voting. There are no mail-in ballots. You can only vote on the same day. So what does that mean for people who are particularly who are potentially wage earners or have um, um, jobs they can't leave? They can't vote. So the state, and then you have the voter ID laws and a lack of a number of um, DMVs in the state. So it's still extraordinarily restrictive. And here's a, another question. And this is kind of a challenging one, which is that so many people are now saying they have been disillusioned, that mm -hmm. 
they voted and nothing changed. Um, and so we now have, there's concern that the uh, caller is saying is that you have people who are disillusioned yeah. and the there are other folks who are very motivated to vote that's right. And many of those who are very motivated to vote are not motivated to be on the inclusive side. Right. What would you suggest? Uh, so two things, because we hear that a lot. So Common Power, which is our, our uh, parent organization. And if you go to commonpower.org, I'd love we'd love to have you visit the website and and join us with mobilizing voters. We deal with that. And so, number one, not voting is a vote for the other candidate. First and foremost, if you decide not to vote. Number two, when people say that their vote doesn't matter, what we often do when we knock on doors and talk to voters is point to election after election where uh, people won or lost by a small margin. People forget that school boards are elected. The lecture that I just gave to you right now, if I were in the state of Florida, and I am not exaggerating, I would have been fired for doing that in a public school because it goes against the laws that were passed. And many of those laws are pushed A, by the governor, or B, by school boards, or both. We have the power to um, um, elect different officials. School boards, and you can look this up, are often elected by 10 or 5 or 1 person makes the difference. And so your vote does matter. Sheriff elections. We talk about an election that we were involved in in Virginia where the candidate won by one vote. And so when we tell people that and we explain that and we point to those elections, you can see a light bulb oftentimes. I had a conversation with a young voter who's about 26 years old, and he said, I never thought about it like that. And then he registered to vote with us on the spot. That's great. Um, now, you spoke, when you spoke about the history, you did remind people that the, the party of Reconstruction mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. time was the Republican Party. That right. the Republican Party and the you know the Democrats and Republicans have switched on this. They, um, and, right, it's the Republicans and, who are now instituting those voter restriction measures. Right, and you see that, but the black congressmen who actually were engaged in the Fifteenth Amendment, that story is hardly ever told. Do you have right. a little bit of, you know, give people a little bit so that people can leave from this and say. Let me tell you about Hiram Rebels or, you know. Uh... Absolutely. So one of the, a couple of places, and I'm actually going to tell you guys the name of a book that you'll love on this. It's not, it's hardly ever told. That's exactly right. The way that you just characterized it. Um, and so you can get some of that in some of Eric Foner's work, but there is a book that is um, by William Gillette. It was published in 1965 and it is excellent. It has been republished many times since then, including in, in 2019. William Gillette, um, I think it's called something the right to vote or something, I'm looking for it, but it breaks down a lot of those early statistics so that you can see exactly how it was that so many northern states were opposed to voting and how African Americans um, were the ones voting. I've also done a lot of primary source research, so I've worked not only as a historian in the academy, but as a public historian, and so I did a lot of work around Texas. My book, uh, Lynching and Leisure, is about Texas, and I've gone through the reconstruction records, and I have at my house the voting registration polls of 1867 that shows all the black men who were registering to vote at the time. And also I should note, and Elsa Barkley Brown, who is a historian at the University of Maryland does great work on this. Black women were involved in voting too. They couldn't vote, but they accompanied men to the polls. They sat in at the constitutional conventions. They were not just sitting in, they were vocally a part of those uh, state conventions. And so Black women were engaged in the political process, even in the absence of having the ability to cast a vote. And one final question um, is one of our <clears throat> questioners is, the Bill of Rights says that all men are created equal. And yet that we still have discriminatory laws and why, uh, you know, discriminatory activity. Why? Is it that the constitutional protections from the Bill of Rights have not resolved this? 
because there continue to be forces in opposition to making sure that we have an inclusive democracy. And that's the truth. And so the work that we do at the Institute for Common Power, Common Power, the work that I know some of you who are on this uh, call have done and continue to do is the work to not rest and say, oh, everybody has those rights, but to be the louder force against those who oppose an inclusive democracy. I look at the past. History, I often call as a primer. It shows us what we can do. And if people who are on that Edmund Pettus Bridge could have the bravery to walk across that bridge in protest of being denied the right to vote, what we face today is nothing. We've got this. If they can do that, then we can continue to push to make sure, because that's what I strive for, and that's what we strive for, is to make sure that we have an inclusive democracy with equity. Dr. Scott, you are inspiring. And <laughs> now you understand why we talked about informed patriotism. Um, you know, Thanks. telling these stories and telling them uh, with the full force of truth is the mission of the Capitol Historical Society on all fronts. And we really appreciate your time and your talent and getting up at the crack of dawn in Seattle and <laughs> no you know, join, joining us from a hotel room. Congratulations <laughs> to the Seattle Seahawks for honoring you and for thank being you. involved in getting people out to vote. Thank um, you. We I thank everyone that. who's been with us. Um, we wish you all a wonderful holiday season. We remind you, as we always do, we call this our NPR moment. Uh, this is only possible because of your gifts and your support. Uh, Dr. Scott gifted us her time, uh, an amazing treasure. And so Thank we you. invite you all to continue your membership and your engagement. Share this opportunity with your friends and neighbors, and we are honored to have you with us. Thank, Thank you very you. Thank much. You it's been an honor to be here. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who joined us. All right. Be well. Thank Be you well. all. Bye.